let's say that I'm dealing with a classification problem. And let's keep it simple for now. Let's just say that I want to separate out the blue dots from the red dots. Then what's likely to happen is that I have some sort of a classification algorithm that will try to figure out some sort of a separating line. It might look something like this. And the idea behind this line would be that everything on this side would be classified as a blue dot and everything on this side would be classified as a red one. Now, typically these classifications will never be perfect. There will be some blue dots on the red side of the line and there will be some red dots on the blue side of the line. And given this fact, I hope you might agree with me that maybe it's a pretty good idea to talk about how confident we are in our predictions. Because maybe we can figure out some sort of a boundary around our separating line over here. Now the idea here is, is that the region that I've drawn over here, maybe I can say, well, this is my non-confident region. A way to think about it is that the further away we are from the separating line, the more sure that we might be that we are indeed in the blue region. And maybe the further that I am from the separating line on the other end, the more certain I can be that I'm in the red region. But there is this area in the middle where the odds of overlap might just be a little bit too big. And in these situations, if we get a new data point that sits in that non-confident region, so to say, well, maybe it's best not to automate, but instead to apply a fallback scenario. And if we think about dialog systems, then I hope you would agree that having a way to declare a fallback is very useful. Now, the reason why it's going to be very useful to have a fallback region is that it allows us to ask a user for clarification at appropriate times. If we're unsure about the next action, it might be better to fail elegantly. So let's briefly discuss the Raza pipeline one more time. If I take a pretty big step back, then I can say, well, there are two main parts that decide the next action in a conversation. There is the natural language understanding part, that's on the left, and there is the core part that I will say is on the right here. And as an example, diet is an algorithm that we typically use inside of the NLU pipeline to predict the intent that a user has. And on this side, we have Ted to predict the next action. And given a very high overview, Typically here, we've got ourselves a modeling pipeline that is going to be predicting an intent. And then this intent is typically picked up by our policy mechanism. Let's say in this case, it's Ted. And out here would come our next action. Now I'm glancing over a couple of details here. The machine learning model here will get a lot of features that are generated as well. And, and I'm not explicitly mentioning those. And if we are using TED as a policy mechanism here, then we also typically have the conversation so far. But from this vantage point, I hope you might agree that there's actually not one, but two places where we can maybe say that we are uncertain about a prediction. There might be uncertainty here and here. Both Diet and TED, they give this confidence number when they make a prediction. If I look here on Diet, we might have intent A, B, C and D, and a prediction could be something like, well, I think it's intent A with a confidence of 0 0.8, 0 0.1, 0 0.05, and that it's D with a very small number. And the idea is that we could use these numbers to determine our confidence here, but something really similar will be happening here if we're using TED. The main difference here is that we don't have an intent that we're trying to detect, but instead we might have different actions that we'd like to predict. As you might notice, these confidence numbers are designed in such a way that they sum up to one. In that sense, it's like a probability value. And because of that property, a heuristic of deciding whether or not we should fall back is to say, well, let's just grab the over here, that would be intent A. And over here, that'd be action three. And then we can say, well, let's just check if that 
confidence is larger than or equal to a certain threshold. If the threshold is 0 0.7, then we could say here, oh yeah, the intent, that's done with confidence, that's fine. But here it's less than 0 0.7, so here we might be able to trigger a fallback scenario. Now, given that we do have a trigger moment that we want to fall back, it is good to maybe take a step back and also consider, well, what happens when a trigger is actually triggered? In the case of the NLU pipeline, what is probably happening is that we have a system like Diet, and Diet is predicting an intent. It's known which intent has the highest confidence, and the value of this confidence is also known. So that means that we can have a fallback classifier around, and its job is to have a look at that intent that's produced by Diet, and if the fallback classifier is not triggered, then it won't do anything. But if the classifier does get triggered, then the following behavior happens. The intent that comes out of Diet will be overwritten, and instead the fallback classifier is going to be sending out an intent instead. And a typical name for such an intent would be something like unclear. And the idea behind this intent, this fallback intent, is that it's something that can be picked up by a policy mechanism later to perform the right action. Now the end goal that we might have here is that we match that fallback intent to some sort of action that is something along the lines of, could you repeat that? If we ask the user to rephrase, then the NLU pipeline might be able to make a prediction with enough confidence. And what's really nice to mention here is that this is where our trusty little rule policy actually has a part to play. And that's because the rule policy can be configured to say something like, well, whenever the fallback intent is triggered, no matter where in the conversation, then the only right action to take is to ask the user to rephrase his or her question. So even though we have a fallback mechanism that is being triggered on the NLU side of our prediction pipeline, we are still able to combine this fallback intent with a policy that's part of our core pipeline to predict the next action. Now note that the same rule policy can also be configured to handle the fallback mechanism on the core side of the pipeline. If we assume a situation where we just get our normal intent out of the NLU pipeline, where the fallback classifier is not triggered, then we can still be in a situation where it's the TET policy that will be making the decision on what next action to take. And also here, it can be the case that there's a prediction being made here, in this case for an action, that doesn't have a high enough confidence. Now, if that's the case, then the rule policy can be configured to trigger a fallback. And just like before, we will be overriding a prediction. And also here we can specify what to do when we trigger the fallback. But in this case, we will be selecting an action instead of a intent, which typically is something along the lines of, hey, we're gonna trigger an action that's going to ask the user to rephrase or repeat the question using different words. In this video, I hope to have demonstrated that in Raza, there are methods at our disposal to trigger a fallback that is based on confidence. And it's an amazing tool to have, but I should stress that it's not a free lunch. And there's two reasons why. For starters, we have to ask ourselves, when do we consider a confidence too low such that this fallback gets triggered? And it's something to really think about. This threshold value will depend a lot on your specific training data. So this is something that you will have to tune yourself for your specific use case. But there's also another aspect that we have to consider, and that has to do with the nature of the feedback mechanism itself. Because we have to admit that this fallback mechanism is not 100% perfect. And let me draw out a classification situation to make clear what I mean by this. It's a very similar picture to what I drew before, I'll have my blue dots, I'll have some red ones, and let's say that I've also got some green ones now. Then instead of having a single line that's gonna go through all of these points, I will probably have more of a three landmark 
that will separate all of these different groups. And given a certain value for my fallback threshold, you can imagine that I might have these bounds around these separating lines that tell me when I should be triggering a fallback. Now, this is all still a fairly good idea, but a question that might arise is, what do we do if we get a data point that is very much unlike anything we've seen before in our training data? Maybe we get a point over here. Well, then I hope you might agree in this two-dimensional example that this region that we've defined here won't be able to capture out-of-scope situations like this one. One way of dealing with this is to maybe start thinking about different kinds of out-of-context words that you might be able to have on your assistant. If I think about all sorts of texts that my assistant might not be trained on, then I might be able to consider that we have a situation where we just get gibberish. Instead, you might also get the wrong language. And what you might be able to do is you might be able to gather some examples of these different classes of out-of-context words, and then you might be able to define these as intents instead. Now, this idea has merit to it, but maybe there's another way of thinking about this than just intents. What if we make our own custom language fallback classifier? The idea is similar to what we had before, but the method of triggering the policy will be different. Now before, the fallback would get triggered if the model in the pipeline wasn't confident. But because Raza is open source and made with Python, nothing is stopping us from making our own fallback classifier. And that would include a classifier to detect what language is being spoken at the moment. Assuming the assistant that I'm making right now is written with the English language in mind, then this classifier can trigger whenever we see non-English text, and then we can trigger the intent to ask the user to revert back to English. And I can do something similar here for the gibberish use case. So in the next video, what I'll do is I'll get started on my own language fallback classifier as an experiment, and I'll share any lessons that I've learned along the way.